there we go. Uh, please let us know if, um, if you uh, would prefer to opt out of that and then the team can, uh, can pause. Um, very much looking forward to a vibrant discussion in the Q&A sessions. Uh, please uh, use uh, the chat and, and also uh, the time allocated uh, in order to discuss. Um, and so uh, once again, uh, welcome everyone and uh, very much looking forward to today's uh, agenda. And I will hand over to uh, Dr. Matt Clarkson who will be chairing the first session. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Dan. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Clarkson. I'm an associate professor here at Weiss, uh, researching various things in augmented reality. But today, it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Professor Mark Billinghurst from the University of South Australia in Adelaide. Uh, Professor Billinghurst is director of the Empathic Computing Lab, uh, which is about developing computer systems that recognise and share emotions and help people better understand virtual environments but obviously he's been in this field for uh, I say decades now and, and a whole a whole raft of publications in virtual reality augmented reality and the HCI that goes along with that so there's clearly much common ground between uh, his lab and, and, the, and the work of Weiss and what we're interested in for surgery so uh, I'm sure we're in for a fabulous talk so without further ado uh, if you're ready Mark uh, we'll hand over to you, uh, and if you can fire up your slides, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It thinks in me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Great, excellent. Let me just share my um, slides here. So I'm actually joining you from New Zealand um, today, so it's um, about nine o'clock in the evening here, and I'm excited to present. Okay for you? Um, are you seeing full screen there? Seeing full yeah. screen on your main slides. Yep. yep. Excellent. Good. Okay, good. So I'm going to, so I have done some in the past on medical applications, but I'm mostly going to talk today about um, collaboration and, and the implications of that for, for, um, for telemedicine in, in the medical space. Um, my, most of my research lab focus in New Zealand and also in Australia is on collaborative systems. But I guess, like most of you, over the last um, year or two, our workspace has pretty much looked like this. It's, it's feel, it feels like we've been in some sort of grand experiment to see how well we collaborate with the variety of today's tools. And of course, most of us, um, after a while, start feeling very tired um, because of a variety of psychological cognitive factors of dealing with, um, uh, dealing with um, working over Zoom. So telecom, uh, of course, this is screens um, there's other ways we can connect um, including you know uh, dedicated teleconferencing suites or mobile apps or even these telepresence uh, robots but some of the limitations with the current technology is that you have really have a lack of spatial cues the person blends with the background have oftentimes poor cues limited gaze and gesture nonverbal so this introduction of these artificial seams between the physical space the um, communication um, space Contrast that with face-to-face -face communication, and um, you have a wide variety of communication cues used. Here's a group of architects, and you know they're they're pointing at this uh, model they've got. They're looking at the environment and the pictures. They're sharing gaze and cues, visual cues. Um, but before, you know, when you're in face-to-face -face communication, you have this task space, and the task space in this case is really a subset of the overall communication space. But when you introduce technology into the mix, things start to differ. Um, so, for example, here's a um, here's a typical um, group of people looking at a monitor, and you can see here, you know, the task space is obviously what's on the monitor, and the communication space is um, separate from the monitor. Oh, I just got a message saying that my internet keeps cutting out. Is uh, am I okay now, or is it still not working? Uh, it's dropping in and out. I don't know if it helps turning a webcam off, but it may do. But I'm then... really sorry about that. Um, no, see, it's okay right now, but it, it it was droppy a few minutes ago. Okay. Well, should we push on? Or I can turn my camera off if you want me to. Um, it sometimes helps. <laughs> okay. Might help yeah, me... your camera off. Uh, yeah, there we go. My camera's off. If, if, you, um, if I'm still having issues, please send me a message on the chat. Yep. And I can change the access point in my house. But I was having some trouble before, but I 
moved closer to the access point and it should be working fine but anyway um anyway we'll push on and like i said if you have any issues please just message me and we'll see what we can do about that so as i was saying um you know when we introduce technology into the mix we have this um separation between the task space and the communication space and even with remote conferencing here's a typical setup and you can see people um you know, they've got one screen showing the faces of their collaborators, a second screen showing what they're talking about. And again, you have this um, communication seam in between. And you know, in, in telemedicine now, of course, is a very important topic. And with um, COVID um, reducing travel and the need to be able to have expertise um, remotely um, in medical, many medical situations, there's a big emphasis on that. But even in these situations, you see that same separation between the task space and the workspace. You can see on the left here a typical green-based telemedicine system, and on the right, a telesurgery robot where the, the, the surgeon is actually you know, remote from the patient and themselves. But when we look at other technologies like augmented reality, we can overcome this um, artificial seam. So here's two people looking through an augmented reality headset. And in this case, the task space now becomes a subset of the communication space because they can see each other. Similarly, with virtual reality, we can we can have online conferencing where we feel like we're really in the same space. And so this is a fireside chat that I was at a few months ago with Tom Furness, who's one of the founders of, of VR, and you know, really could share those same spatial cues. So you can use AR and VR for some quite interesting next generation collaboration, and um, in particular by using it to change uh, people's perspectives, their views, to change and copy spaces and change scale, to copy bodies and to um, share nonverbal cues. And I'll talk a little bit about these things and I'll also pull it together at the end and show how this could be applied into medical medical domain. So first of all, changing perspective, um, actually for a lot of research started actually in Britain with the British Telecom and Camnet, but about 25 or 30 years ago, people were exploring putting cameras on their heads and live streaming the camera view to a remote person who could then see through what they see what they're seeing and help provide remote assistance um, and studies like by, by Carnegie Mellon for example showed that this would typically cut performance time in half on, on physical tasks and they can live stream the view to a remote person so that's video you see oh, I'm sorry Anna you see break there Can you hear me now? I can hear you. It just it was dropping okay. out a minute ago, but okay, yeah, it's back. I'm just wondering if I should change access point or we should keep going. Um, hard to tell, but it, as we're near the start, it might be worth trying. Okay, let me just try that. Um, Okay, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, sounds okay. Great, okay. Let's see how we go. I'm just really sorry about this. Um, I, I think um, we're having some bad weather in New Zealand right now that may be infecting the, the Wi-Fi. Um, so let me push on. So uh, I, just showed, I just showed this video of a typical um, AR remote collaboration system where you can, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, person's view through the headset display and they're live streaming that video to the right hand side, the person who's on the remote expert and the remote expert can draw on the video and send the annotation back. So you see that over top of the real world. And this is, there are many systems that, uh, that um, do this now. So a couple of years ago, we explored how we could actually uh, share more communication cues than what's normally possible with this type of system. And particularly we, we combined together an eye tracking with, um, an AR pair of glasses and a special pair of frames that measured people's face expression. And this was designed to share the implicit communication cues we normally have in face-to-face -face communication, um, like gaze and face expression. So this is the setup here. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the, the view through the head mount display. And in particular, you can see um, this green uh, dot and the green dot is, um, represents the pointer of the remote person providing help and then this red dot who which is the eye gaze of the person performing the task and this is really important because typically with the remote camera sharing applications you want to have a very wide field of view camera so you can see as much as the workplace as you can when you have that you, you're not exactly sure the person who's using the system is looking 
And so this system allowed us to share um, more knowledge about where they're looking and more implicit communication cues for remote collaboration. So here's a video of the system working. You can see on the right hand side, the person wearing the system and doing a task that involves um, block assembly. And then on the left hand side, the person helping them. And in particular, you can see now the person is going to be um, moving around this green pointer and the person on the uh, we're wearing the system, we can follow their eyes with the red um, gaze pointer there. So the remote expert now knows whether the person is paying attention or not. And so they can uh, point at different things and say, you know, look at this. And they can know whether they're paying attention because they can see if their eye gaze is naturally going over that space. This is the technology we used for tracking face expression using photo sensors. And we could also from that measure when the person is showing frustration or other simple face expressions. One of the limitations of this system, though, is that um, even though you can see from the camera view of the person, uh, you don't get much awareness of all their surroundings, and you only have a limited view into that remote location. So a, a little bit after that, we developed a system that let us share a full 360 video of their surroundings. So you have a person wearing an augmented reality display, they can share video of in full 360, and the remote person can be in a, a VR headset and then can be looking around independent of them. Also, a remote person in VR, we can capture their hand gestures and we can share gesture cues back to the person um, in the augmented reality headset. So here's a video of this working. In, in this case, it's a project with a power company. And you can see the person standing there in front of a quite complicated uh, control panel, wearing um, an AR display and, and a 360 camera. And then the... Um, in their view, they see these kind of ghost hands, which is from the remote person, and the person, can, remote person, can annotate on the real world, and we can see those pointing annotations appearing. Um, and then that green square shows where the remote person is looking, because they can look anywhere they want now, so they may be looking in different directions. So here's the remote person. There, um, from their perspective, they're inside a 360 video, and it really feels like they're standing in the same location as the person wearing the AR display. And as I said before, they can make natural hand gestures and those are transmitted remotely as well. Um, one of the limitations of this system though is that they can only, they're only sharing a 360 video. So the remote person doesn't really get a strong sense of depth and, and for example, can't walk through the space. And so um, has a limited spatial awareness of the, the whole um, space. So most recently we've done some work on being able to live stream uh, real spaces. And the vision is that sometime in the near future we'll be able to have a handheld device um, that will allow us to capture and live stream a 3D model of an environment and have another have another person being able to walk through that environment. So you know, we could put this cluster of depth sensors on a tripod and live stream from that control panel. So here's a video of how that works currently. You can see on the left hand side the God's eye view, the right hand side this is a first person perspective. And now we can we can live stream that 3D space and we can have people walking through the space. You can see now one of my students walking into the space and appearing as a, a 3D mesh in that space. Now, this is far from being able to be used in, in real work. So you can see all the blue areas are the, are the areas where we have occlusion and we can't see um, um, under the table or behind people, for example. But it does create a very compelling sense of um, depth. And in and, and the VR view, you certainly can walk through the space and feel like you're really there. So over the last few years, we've seen this viewing evolution from just sharing 2D video to sharing uh, 360 uh, video and then finally 3D um, spaces. And this creates a, a much higher sense of immersion and improved um, scene understanding. Now there's other things you can do as well. And one of the areas we're really interested in looking at how we can use technology to share communication cues. And so once you've captured a copy of the real world, you know, you could have remote people attend, uh, being in that space together. But you can also use uh, VR and AR to share additional communication cues, such as gaze or gesture or head pose. And so, AR and then gaze. So, here we've got these two avatars by pink heads. And then we had different viewing conditions, and in particular, we drew a view frustrum. And so the view frustrum shows where the person you have to see the person's face to be aware of they're looking. But in this case, 
we can create this view for us driven. So now I can be aware of somebody where somebody else is looking without even uh, seeing their face at all. And then we did a study to see how the collaboration. So here's a video of the system working. We created a, a, a duplicate of a real lab space. In the augmented reality view, I can see this pink head in the real world, and here's the VR view. And then we have these pink lines going out, which is the view frustrum. So when I look sideways, I can see this frustrum beside me, and that shows me the person in the space with me is an object, but I, and there's their face coming now, but I don't need to look to see their face anymore to know where they're looking. So we found that by sharing this uh, simple communication cue, that significantly improved performance and here's some results um, from a user study. We found actually that there was no difference between sharing eye pointing and head pointing, but both of them um, provide better performance than having no a cue at, at all. And um, people thought that that created much, uh, made it much easier to understand where their partner was looking and improved collaboration significantly. Uh, with that type of AR VR collaboration system, there's other things you can do as well. And one of them is that you, for example, could change the user's body scale. And so you could make um, the person in VR much smaller or much larger than they would be in the real world. And that changes the nature of the collaboration. So here's a video of that working. We've got um, on the on the left hand side there, you've got somebody in, in VR. And the right hand side, this is a view inside um, an augmented reality view of a um, uh, from an apartment. And the person in VR just changes their body to be four times as big. And so they have God's eye perspective down onto the VR space. And you might want to use this, for example, if you're trying to manage a team. Smaller. And so in, in this, just a second, you'll see how the person can scale themselves down to be um, a tenth normal size. And that might be useful if you want to explore into spaces where you couldn't if you are normally the same um, size. So one of the interesting things about using AR and VR is you can you can do things like changing body scale. So here they are, the person in VR is much smaller looking up at this giant head, looking down at them. And of course, you could also do things like snapping into and sharing the same view. And this could be really important for a teaching situation or remote expertise situation where you want to see exactly what the person is doing and provide some help. We've done some research also on, on um, the importance of sharing uh, gesture cues, and I showed you already with the 360 video, we've got the ability to capture hand gestures and share them. And so we're quite interested in about when do you want to um, share a, a, a virtual hand, or when is it su sufficient just to have a pointer appearing as well. So we did this study where we had a person inside um, VR that was helping somebody uh, assemble this puzzle in the real world in an AR view, and we had a hand tracker, then we could, and the, and the person in the AR could see. Um, their hand by itself, or their hand in a pointer, or a sketching cue, and um, all three combined uh, together to basically explore what type of gesture cue should be shared in AR VR collaboration. And what we found um, when we, we used um, uh, four different hand cues, and we also looked at three different um, experiment tasks. Uh, one was a Lego assembly task where we could assemble Lego bricks. Second one was um, a tank assembly task and a third was origami folding. And you'll notice in particular that the Tangram task is really a, a two-dimensional task. It's just arranging objects on a surface. Whereas Lego is more of a three-dimensional task and involves more spatial um, cues. So we, we measured the performance and what we found was that, um, um, it's a bit complicated this slide, but we, what we found was that in the um, Lego uh, task, uh, there was a much, um, 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 significant time difference between using the hand gestures and pointing and um, and um, and sketching. Um, whereas in the other tasks, um, the pointing um, didn't make much difference from the hands by themselves or having sketching made a big difference because in the 2D task, being able to sketch and draw in the real world was more important than being able to see a 3D, um, 3D hand. So we basically found that sketched cues enable person, people to complete tasks much faster. Adding um, pointing didn't improve the task completion time, but um, and also didn't improve the sense of co-presence. And you have this nice quote that from um, one of the subjects saying that sketching allows for greater accuracy, um, and it's also useful for describing actions that are very difficult to describe by words. So for some types of tasks, um, we think that using a sketching or pointing interface, or sketching in particular, is much more important. Um, We've also done some research on 
um, um, sharing gaze cues. And I showed one video from the ARVR collaboration. But in this case, we had a simple gaze pointer, just a virtual line. But it turns out, um, as probably many of you know, um, when people are gazing around, they exist, they exhibit many different gaze behaviors. Uh, for example, you can have a scanning behavior where you're searching very quickly to try and find objects, or you can you can focus on an object and you can dwell um, on that object and, and spend um, a certain amount of time looking at that object. Um, so we thought that it would be interesting to not only just show a traditional virtual gaze line, but have different gaze cues depending on the um, eye gaze performance or behavior people had. And so we developed a 360 panorama mixed reality collaboration system. We again capture the space and share with the person in VR. And then we showed um, different gaze behaviors to um, uh, be able to enable people to know what the other person was, was doing. Um, so you can see um, here, um, we have um, on the right hand side, this shows um, three different gaze behaviors when you are uh, focusing on a particular location. So you, 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 your eye gaze is lower on that location for greater than half a second. The virtual gaze line is shown as yellow. When, mo when both people look at the same um, location, then you have a green gaze line. And, um, and, and as you uh, start fixating, um, the gaze line turns uh, blue and it leaves a trail of dots behind kind of a heat map effect. And finally, if you're rapidly browsing around and so you don't pause any time longer than half a second, then you have this light blue um, line here as well. So we're quite interested to see whether this um, behavior um, with gaze representations changes people's behavior and if it creates a greater sense of connection. So this um, shows the system working. We had uh, this is the AR view, and in the AR view, if you look around, you can see virtual head, and the virtual head is the person who is um, in VR. Task. In this particular case, we had um, a gaze uh, searching task. We were able to search for different icons. So you can see in the um, bottom left hand side, for example, there's um, mutual gaze, the green gaze line, and the bottom right, the one person fixed. On a point, and so they have a yellow gaze line, and in the um, it's similarly in the top, um, showing that yellow gaze line as well. And so here's a short video showing the system working. I'll just turn off the our um, system. Audio so this was presented at the Kai conference just a um, just a, a month or so ago. So this is the system set up as I said before with the person in our and via, and this is the first day these to explore how different. Um, Gaze behaviors could be represented in an ARV collaborative um, system. So you have the, the local person who's looking around to try and find these icons and the remote person in VR who's um, helping them search for icons as well. So you can see the gaze lines appearing there. And then as they overlap, then the gaze turns from yellow to green and they focus on the same, um, same point. Now when it's blue, the person is scanning very quickly around um, the location. So um, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit here um, to show you um, the, um, the behavior states I talked about before. So this is the browsing state again. So um, gaze line is blue as it's not quickly. And um, you can see your own gaze as well as, as your partner's gaze. So this is now um, the focusing state. So you when you um, looking at the point you trail behind it and you can start focusing. And when both of you focus at the same point, then the, the gaze line turns um, turns um, green. So this is a mutual um, gaze behavior in green. So we're, we're just in the middle of doing um, these um, studies now. So we haven't finished the analysis. This was presented as a as a short late, late breaking work at Kai, but we should have some analysis from this done um, in the next month or so. The, the preliminary results seem to show that Having this gaze visualization really helps the collaboration, but people don't want to see their own gaze cues. They want to see the gaze cue of the other person, not of themselves. Um, one of the other interesting things we've been exploring is, is how we can separate communication cues away from the body. So, you know, if you have two people inside VR, then of course you can only see the gesture and face expression of the person when you look at their virtual body. But there may be other situations, just like in the real world, where you can't see them anymore. So on the left-hand side, you can see 
two people in VR, and now one person's moving towards this object. And of course, they can no longer see the person who's behind them anymore. So we had the idea, well, when you lose track of the person in either the real world or the virtual world, why don't we take, make a miniature copy of that person and put them back into your view so you can still see those cues. And so we developed this system called Mini-Me, and this was designed for an AR VR collaboration. So you can see the light of the virtual avatar that appears. When I look away from the avatar, and I can see on the right hand side, you can see a little miniature person. This miniature version of the person, same gesture patterns, pointing at the same. And so this is interesting because this means now I don't need to look at somebody else to receive the gaze or the communication cues from them, the nonverbal communication cues. I can still see what they're pointing at or see what they're looking at. And this is also particularly important for AR systems where you have oftentimes limited field of view with your AR head mounted display. So let me show a little video of this. So here's one of the problems with AR displays. This is the whole lens. And you know, with a 50 degree field of view or 45 degree, you can't see the avatar and what they're pointing at at the same time because you don't have enough uh, field of view there. So with our system, when the avatar is out of view, you see this little miniature guy that pops into view and shows those same behaviors. So um, here, for example, he's pointing at this real box and the person now, you know, is just, as I showed in the video before, the life-size avatar is behind them, but the miniature person can appear and point at the same real box in the real um, world. So it enables them to communicate and collaborate without having to see each other. So the mini-me um, just pops out once you start, can't see the person anymore. So here's the life-size person, we look away, and now the little miniature guy appears and is pointing at that same location in the real world. Um, and then exhibits the same behaviors um, and gesture cues as well. You can also pin the person in the space if you want to. So you can say, well, I want the person to always be there. And the little miniature guy will appear there while you're looking around as well. So we did a study with this and we um, we had people perform two types of collaboration tasks, an asymmetric task where one person had a more senior role than the other and a symmetric task where they both had the same role. And we found that um, by using the mini-me and by always showing those communication cues, they were able to perform the task 20% faster. It also had a higher sense of um, presence. And um, depending on the tasks that we asked them, between 60 and 75% of people say that they preferred using this communication behavior than without having the mini-me virtual avatar. And one person, for example, said that I've really felt that I'm talking to my partner because they're always in view. So to kind of pull things together a little bit, um, so from the experiments we've been doing, um, we've learned a number of key lessons that I think can be applied into the medical domain and for telemedicine. So first of all, it's really important to try and combine the task space and the communication space so that when people are focusing on the task, they can still be aware of communication cues. Um, secondly, you know, we've shown with our 360 video and with capturing the real world, it's important to try and provide um, space awareness, both awareness of, of your partner and of their surrounding environments. With the work we've done on gaze and um, body gesture communication cues, um, we can share um, implicit communication cues. And so, you know, with the gaze, for example, when you are um, uh, when you are trying to help have somebody perform an action, they're always going to look at a real object before they pick it up. So that's a really great way to know what they're about to do. Um, we've also done some work on separating the communication cues from the body and being able to show them different ways. And then some of the research around matching communication cues to task requirements. So in the, in the example, for example, with the gesture and sketching, um, in that case, uh, to complete the tangram task, sketching was um, sufficient to do that. We didn't have to have um, a rich pointing interface or things like that. So to think about how this can be applied into um, a medical situation, I want to show the research of somebody else. This isn't my, this isn't my research, but this is a research um, from the University of um, UCSD in San Diego. And they just presented this at um, Kai uh, a month ago, and they had developed a mixed reality telemedicine suite that can be used for remote mentoring and also for remote expert assistance. And there's really two parts. So on the left hand side, this is representing um, a real um, sur surgery um, with a with an, a novice um, surgeon who's wearing an augmented reality display, and in their view, this virtual expert appears um, providing them help. And right hand side, this is a view of the virtual expert and um, where they see a representation of the patient body of the novice surgeon, but they have also live camera feeds in the operating theater and the ability to provide annotations and, and watch video clips and so forth. 
So I'm going to show you a video of this. And as I said, this is not my work, but it, it shows quite nicely how you can pull together some of the lessons learned that we talked about, like being able to um, support spatial awareness by providing multiple views. So um, you can see here, this is the view of the, um, the remote um, expert. And so they've got um, a, a VR view. There's a patient in front of them. This is the real world. So this is the remote expert appearing as a virtual avatar. Um, they've got uh, obviously head pointing and and um, and then um, you'll see in a minute the um, remote expert in VR is able to draw on the patient and have those annotations appear on the real patient um, body so they can share those rich um, annotation cues we we're talking about before. Because they've got multiple uh, real camera feeds coming into the space, they get a really strong sense of um, of spatial awareness. Of course, the representation of the um, of the patient on the table there. Um, you can see that they're using the laser pointer to point at objects. In a minute, you'll see the view from the real world and see how that's reflected in the real world. So um, you can see a, a small pointer. Oh, well, now you can see the annotation appearing in the real world. So the person through the whole lens can see marked on the body where they should be um, performing some actions. And then um, they can also um, load ported video and show the person some uh, videos that may help them perform this procedure and so forth. So this is a really nice example of, of what a future telemedicine interface might look like that combines together that task space and communication space. So just to finish, um, um, I've, I've talked a little bit about how current conferencing situations have limitations. Um, you know, you have a number of physical, cognitive and social shortcomings that cause fatigue and um, certainly don't make us feel like we're communicating as we would face to face. But augmented and virtual reality allows us to kind of go beyond being there and support new types of collaboration, like, such as changing your perspective, capturing and sharing spaces and nonverbal cues. And there are many lessons from these types of studies that have been formed in the, in, in the AR and VR research community that can be applied in telemedicine, such as the importance of using implicit communications. And then research like I just showed you from um, San Diego gives some really exciting examples of how these systems can be developed and can be evaluated um, today. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. Um, here are my contact details and I'll just... Um, um, so I'm happy to answer questions now if you want to reach out to me over um, email or Twitter or, um, or through our website, I'm happy to do that as well. So let me just start my video again. And I should uh, apologize again for the um, for internet connection. I hope you're able to capture most of what I said. And I'm also happy to share my slides um, and videos um, so you can share them later to people. Thank you so much, um, Mark. Uh, Yes, I uh, say so normally do this virtual round of applause, but I'm not sure it quite works as well as a real round of applause. But well, but thank you ever so much. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions right now, uh, if possible. Uh, does anyone want to raise their hand for a question? I'm hoping I can see hand raising gestures on this thing. In the meantime, um, I'll start. I, I like the uh, example at the end because I was kind of wondering uh, a lot of your research has been done with head mounted displays like HoloLens and a lot of what we do, you're using things like an endoscope. So you have augmented reality in the sense of video see through displays. So has any of this kind of gesture um, and collaboration tools been integrated into video see through devices or that paradigm? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, um, so um, in my early research, most of the AR we're doing was on video see-through AR, but yeah. in that case, it had mounted displays. But I did do at least one project where we simulated an endoscope um, view, and we looked at um, virtual um, um, annotations that could be applied onto the endoscope view. And of course, much of surgery, especially today, is through uh, endoscopic um, or uh, over robotic interfaces. So having that video annotation is really important. Um, but, it, but even in that case, so for example, we did a, 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 surg a sinus surgery similar, similar to the endoscopic view. On top of that endoscopic view, we put a little much a 3D model of the So as people were progressing through it, they, they were located in the model. So we still had that situation awareness need as well. So some many of the lessons I've talked about are still very important, um, even if you're not 
um, using head mounted displays. That's good. Uh, I'm just checking for questions. If people could type them in, that would be useful. And then I'll try and read them out. And I'm certainly happy to take questions over email or over chat as well. We're on our yeah. time. I'm more than happy to answer questions later. Nobody else is asking one, then I will. And I can't, sorry, Matt, I can't raise my hand because as a co host, you yeah. don't get your hand. Ah. Um, so thanks, Mark. That was great. Um, it's sort of following on from Matt's question. It seems like, as I was reflecting on your talk, it seemed like there's really three potential roles for the kind of AR, VR technologies in surgery. There's the one that Matt described, which is kind of the overlay one. There's also looking at the team communications and thinking about remote surgery and how the people who are, and robotic surgery and thinking about how the people who are in the space maintain awareness of each other when they don't have kind of full, full, full aware, you know, full natural awareness of each other. And then there's training. And I think mm. your, your final example really focused on surgical training, I think more than surgical. Yes, that's right. yeah. um, but I wondered whether you had also thought much about how you might augment kind of team communications within the surgical context, because that's the one that seemed to be missed out of these three different kind of applications. Yes, that's a really great point. Um, so there's a number of things. So, so first of all, with AR and VR, you have the possibility to look at the um, environment from different people's perspective. And so that what basically means is that now in a team training environment or team environment, people could jump into each other's view. So for example, if you are assisting a, um, a surgeon, um, you might want to be able to see exactly what that surgeon's seeing and provide you know, advice or feedback based on that. Or you may want to jump into the view of one of your attending nurses or something like to get a perspective for their perspective. So by doing that, you can get um, you can ensure that you have much greater team understanding because everybody can knows exactly what each other are seeing and and um, doing. There's also some work being done on um, maintaining team um, awareness. You know, if you're, for example, heads down in an endoscopic view, it may still be important for you to be able to know what's happening around the table with you. And if, you know, if, if the anesthesiologist, for example, is actually watching the, 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 um, the monitor or, you know, if, if your attendee is, is doing something that you, you'd ask them to do. So it can be a, a possible for you to have multiple views into your own view, as, as I showed in that last video, much greater team awareness. So, um, and there's one other area which I didn't touch on right now, we ran out of time, but most recent work is looking at how we can combine um, collaboration with physiological senses. And you can use it to measure people's um, um, emotional um, or physiological state. So for example, you may want to measure the stress level of people in a, in a team environment and be able to communicate that somehow. So if you're doing a telemedicine task, for example, and providing information to a, a surgeon who's locally performing the task, but they're becoming overloaded with information and becoming stressed. If, if we can show that back to you, then you may have, you know, get the message that you should um, reduce the amount of information you're sending or change it in some way. So we're doing some work in that case. And we're also doing work with measuring brain activity in a, in a, in a team situation. And it, it turns out that um, when teams get into sync, the um, brain activity, the EEG signals also start to sync up and start getting into a flow state or, you know, they feel like they're really communicating really well. And that's because their, their brains are actually um, becoming in sync as well. So you can, there's a variety of tasks you can do to measure those types of physiological cues and, and start seeing if they get into sync as well. So there's huge opportunities in the team space, I would say. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Um, we do have two hands up, but uh, I, as chair, I'm mindful of keeping to time. And also, I don't know if you're going anywhere afterwards. Obviously, it's late night for you, Mark. So are you willing to answer one or two more questions? Oh, yes, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, so and as I said, if we run out of time, I'm happy to answer over email as well. So great. No so if Eddie and Steve could, uh, and then we'll, well, then we'll call it and then we'll finish there. So Eddie first, please. Uh, thanks very much. Great talk. Um, it's just a comment really that um, <clears throat> I thought it was really interesting seeing your example where you're trying to live reconstruct the room and mm. move through the room. 
uh, because a lot of the efforts that we've been making in terms of, uh, of vision and robot vision and so on for the endoscopic view is trying to do live reconstruction. And it's a very difficult problem there. And it seems like the live reconstruction is not maybe entirely there for, uh, for, for the real world scenes either. So we've got quite a difficult technical problem, but I think we also need to think about exactly how these, uh, these are used collaboratively, what kind of views um, actually help the surgeon or the trainee or the collaboration between people. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, it's encouraging to see that for this collaborative movement through a room that, it, that there are clearly benefits if you can, if you can really feel like you're in the space. Um, and uh, I just wonder if you if you feel any if you have any notions of, of, of how for an endoscopic view, if we can live reconstruct and have uh, uh, added information, how that would be actually used in, in practice uh, in the surgical environment. Uh, that, endoscopy is very complicated for doing reconstruction because of you, of course, you develop you're dealing with soft tissues and organs, whereas if you're trying to reconstruct a room with physical tables and walls, you know, they don't change shape and things like that. But I think there's a lot of opportunity. I have seen some work done with um, University of Washington was doing some work on using a micro laser scanner to scan, to include that into an endoscope and um, uh, using that. But there's some um, advanced imaging techniques could be applied. Also machine learning is providing huge opportunities right now. So, you know, if you can use machine learning to identify different uh, uh, tissue or organs or other things, that could also help um, with semantic pigmentation from the video. But I think it's a huge task. I mean, we're having a hard enough time to construct a physical lab with solid objects, let alone, um, uh, you know, an endoscopic view with, um, with um, multiple soft um, dynamic organs. I would, but but the, the work, like I said, the laser scan works is very, very promising in that space. Thank, thanks very much. I also agree that sort of machine learning to work out how, how people should move at various points during the procedure and perhaps offering guidance to uh, trainees is also a big, big area. Thank you. It's definitely, for sure. OK, thanks, Eddie. And last question from Steve, if we could. Hello. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, I was just watching you talk and trying to get my head around how it applies to sort of my my research. So all the all of your examples were collaborative between two humans. So we had a maybe a trainee and a and a, and a human expert. Right. Whereas we're all I'm doing sort of systems where we've got a, a human surgeon, for example, and some sort of um, computer algorithmic based information expert. So if you like, it's a collaboration between the human and the machine. Right. Was, what can you comment on on what lessons we can take from from your research on human human collaboration to the sort of stuff we're doing? Uh, well, I think, uh, well, so we, there are some other work we're doing, I didn't show, but we're doing some work on human robot collaboration and being able to um, use natural human gestures to communicate with the robot and, and um, basically manipulate the robot. Things that I think it's, if you're doing human agent or human robot collaboration is to have the agent communicate in a way that's natural. For example, you're doing an endoscopy and you have an artificial agent that is somehow identifying areas on the camera that you should pass them to, then the agent should some way to point or indicate on those areas in, in much the same way as a remote human would point at that same area. So you can use the same um, communication cues that you would in a face-to-face -face situation with a real human, but you have the agent exhibit those same behaviors, and that will make it much easier and more natural for the um, human the agent. So we won't take home this look at um, communication behavior, have a human human communication, see how you can replicate that with virtual agents. So, for example, we project now with a uh, human, and we're, we're trying to get that little human to um, gesture as a 
communicate. And in fact, in some of the work people are doing, you know, when they've got an agent, I mean, sometimes they want to anthropomorphize and human as face, and you know, and and then by doing that a virtual human, then they can provide a lot of uh, rich communication. If the agent tries to communicate something to you, and it's and, and the rhythm isn't very out whether you know a certain the certainty level of, of the uh, reply it's giving to you isn't very really high you may have a confused expression appearing on the character's face or um or you know if you want to um collaborate on physical tasks you could have the character again like pointing or looking at different objects so i think there's a lot of lessons you can learn around around that i'm certainly happy to talk more about this offline um, as well it's a very rich topic well, thank you Great. Thanks again. The, the time. And uh, sorry, any uh, problems. Hopefully, you were able to understand my talk slides um, with everybody, so that um, uh, well with um, Sujin, so that um, he, he, um, they can be shared out to the rest of the group later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for your slides and your email address. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and um, I guess it's time now to move on to the next part of the agenda. So. I will now hand over to uh, is it Anisha and Enrico? Yes, that's us. Hi. Thank you, thank you Matt. Sorry, it's a little late, but uh, yeah, thank you. No worries, that was really interesting. Enrico, do you want to start us off? Yes, I'll um, share the screen. Um, Anisha, if you can, if you can share the link to Miro, that would be great. Um, yes. So we can multitask. So yes, the next, um, what is it, about 50 minutes or so, we um, designed as, a, as an interactive um, session. Um, we are going to start from two very quick um, presentations from Anisha and myself to give you a neck breaking speed sort of overview of research methods in uh, human factors, mostly through examples. So we're not sort of thinking of this as a, as a, as a lecture, so to say, um, with the hope that um, um, if anyone in, in, um, in the room, so to say, is interested in trying to apply um, or try to set up collaborations with the, with the human factors team, this could be a way to get more specific ideas. And then we will get into breakout rooms um, and um, ask each group in the breakout rooms to quickly draft um, how they could structure a, a user study around one of the research projects that they are carrying out in, in ways. So um, if you can, uh, if you have the um, screen real estate, it would be great if you could open Miro as well as a Zoom. Hopefully you see my, my screen sharing. So Miro is essentially sort of an interactive um, whiteboard, if you, if you wish. And uh, it was structured, thanks to Sujong for that, into a number of, of boards. You can see here the uh, team um, involved in running the next part of the session. We will have part one with the presentations in a minute. And then we have instructions for each of the, of the subsequent parts. But it's probably easier to walk through things um, step by step. Um, Anisha, am I forgetting anything or shall we jump? No, in? I think we're we're ready. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and you're going on next, right? That's right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And oops. Okay. Um, can you see? Can you see? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Can you see my uh, yes. presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, great. So, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Human Factors Workshop. And I'm going to fo be focusing this part on um, you, the methods that we use in a human factors or HCI approach, some of them that can provide rich insights into design and requirements for any technology. Um, I'm not focusing on a surgical context, but I've um, hopefully going to um, talk through these methods in a way that that shows an end to end kind of um, iterative way of looking at things. So um, a little about me, I am a lecturer at UCLIC, but I also have a technical background and I have uh, experience in the software industry as well. 
and I, I'm very interested in designing and researching digital health and well-being technologies, um, and a lot of them in challenging contexts. Um, and I use uh, mixed methods, um, mainly qualitative approaches, but supported a lot by quantitative data. And I uh, also enjoy building prototypes and solutions. So the case study I'm going to be talking about today is about facilitating physical activity in people with chronic pain. And just because I've said physical activity, if all of you have been sitting for the last hour, I would encourage you to, um, you know, sort of stretch and uh, whatever else you need to do to get yourselves moving um, as, as I go through this. Um, so I'm going to talk about chronic pain specifically here, but, uh, which was the problem we were addressing. And it's a long-term condition. Um, and it's due to changes in the nervous system that amplify pain signals. It's a disabling condition that affects many people. So clinical resources are stretched and a lot of them are about telling people how to manage it in their own time. And while technologies such as games and apps exist to, um, to help people to do more physical activity, they're not extensively used by people with chronic pain or recommended by physiotherapists. Um, so there is rehabilitation in the form of games and apps, but they're mainly focusing on fun, adherence and tracking. And why does this not work for things like chronic pain? Uh, so I'm going to uh, sort of run this video in the background to show this is a person with chronic pain uh, doing simple sit stand movements and so on. And while usually pain is considered to be um, adaptive, in this case, um, it, is, it is maladaptive. And being active uh, can protect against weakening and inhibit the spread of pain, but the experience of pain can, it can convey threat and generate fear of movement. And so it undermines adherence to any kind of physical activity program. And, uh, and, like in, and in a lot of these cases, you can see that there, the person is stretching, and, but how much they're stretching is not always um, in accordance with what is being modeled to them. Uh, for example, this person said, my proprioception is poor because of fear. So it's about fear of movement. And even though the fear is very real, it's not even conscious, but it's definitely something that's ever present. So the question we were asking here was, how can interactive multimodal technology support people with chronic pain during self-directed physical rehabilitation? And we started off using a user-centered design approach, um, and a lot of it was around establishing requirements in the beginning. So getting involved at the early stages was really helpful um, for, for designing the solution. And then you know, looking at what are the alternatives that could be possible, um, prototyping and evaluating, and we were doing all of this at that time. And the, the thing we were doing when establishing requirements is looking at what are people's current needs and practices and what could be their future needs or aspirations. So the focus was on users and tasks and the context, but also on the goals and values that people have that would help them to, um, to focus here. And, um, and while we were looking at tasks, not all systems are task-based or easily specified. So it was important to understand what were the end goals and the context, where will the system be used? Uh, what sort of technology will be deployed and what matters to the user? What are their concerns? So we can learn a lot by asking people about their difficulties and motivations. And this is where interviews come in, but also by watching people um, in their workplaces or context of use, doing the tasks and using the technology. Um, and of course, there's a lot of work in, in WISE that has also been done in similar cases, but I'm just going to talk through this particular example. Um, so one of the questions that we started off with, what are the barriers to physical activity that uh, people with chronic pain have? And we ran quite a few studies. I'm going to focus on, um, on just a couple of them. But we ran role plays. And this was one, one thing that we did where we, we ran them with just two physiotherapists reflecting on, on their patients that week before we got ethics. So we knew how to design the study. And this was quite important because it didn't distress patients or intrude on their privacy, but also helped us to get uh, interesting information. The next, next, we did the qualitative research interviews uh, with people with chronic pain to understand, because they are the experts, to understand what their experience of living or being active with pain was, but also with physiotherapists to, to understand what the recommendations were for physical activity. And actually, it's quite interesting because uh, while people with chronic pain were like focusing on, we want to do the correct movement so we don't do more damage and, and so on and so forth, which is a valid concern, the physiotherapists were only interested in getting them to move a little more and you know sort of get used to that movement which would help them uh, achieve daily goals 
And we also used focus groups, which are like group interviews uh, to clarify, extend, qualify, and challenge the data that we collected through the other methods. And through our, our studies, we identified various barriers, such as uh, you know, decreased proprioception and low motivation. But more and more it emerged that physios provide clear links between activities and how they affect people's lived experience. So for example, one of the physiotherapists recalled a patient who um, said that they could not drive because they could not see over their shoulder because this neck movement was very difficult uh, because of the pain, but repeatedly used that movement to demonstrate so this showed that the movement was possible when the person wasn't focusing on it or fearing, in it, fearing it. So while the pain was real, the movement was affected by fear that it would cause pain. Now, since this is a workshop, I'm also going to sort of uh, show some of the workings of how we re reach the themes and how we analyze the data, just to, just to show some of the rigor that is attached and how the requirements led to design. Uh, so in this context, the users were interested in um, in autonomy and having control, but the game or apps that were not successful, um, they directed the exercise. So they took away the autonomy from the person. There was no learning of how to move in the real world and manage their condition. So while they were telling people to do a certain movement, there was no connection with actual real life movements that people had to do. And there was no ability to address psychological barriers such as fear and so on. And it did not lead to accomplishments in one's life roles that were important to people. And lots of people spoke about decreased proprioceptive feedback and low self-efficacy as in, you know, sort of they were scared, uh, but they could do things when they were not thinking about them. The other thing that was coming out a lot was how does the technology fit? So while, the, uh, while uh, a lot of the games and the apps were about having them present at all times, people had very limited space to move. They wanted to use them in different, interleave them in different contexts. They, as you can see in these pictures, which we did. So when we ran the interviews, we also took pictures of where people were doing this kind of physical activity. And some of the uh, things that are out there just did not take this into consideration. So people wanted to use things for functioning, they just didn't want to just bend for exercise, but they found bending uncomfortable and painful, but they did need to bend for loading the dishwasher and so on. And they wanted support with doing things like that. Um, they challenged themselves in, in the physical activity context by putting things a little bit higher. So they had to reach a little bit further and so on. And they also thought about interleaving activities um, with like sort of taking a breath or taking a break. And they wanted support for that sort of thing as well. So the other thing we then did was went and said, so what kind of strategies can be used to overcome these barriers? What do the physios actually do? And so we did observations in clinical, uh, in sort of like the N in NHS settings where phys physios were directing a group of people doing activity. And um, there were, um, there are a variety of reasons where you would collect this kind of observational data, including this, where the nature of the research question is focused on answering a how, uh, type of question. How do people actually, um, you know, uh, do this in real life or, or uh, how do the physios direct movement in real life? Or the topic is relatively unexplored or when the setting is very important and an understanding of how cer a certain task is done in the setting is very important, observations can be great. But also, in this case, we did the physiotherapist interviews cued by the videos of observations that we had taken. And so we sort of, once we had recorded it, we went back to the physios and we showed them these videos of what they were doing and asked them questions. And uh, that was really interesting because it, it got the physios to reflect as well on what they had been, you know, sort of doing and reflect on their own practice and gave us a lot of insight. And actually the physios uh, led on a paper because they found the reflection so interesting and it was actually not in the literature. So it was, it was a very interesting piece of work. Um, so when we started looking at all of this, and here is where I show you some of the analysis, is we kept talking about decreased proprioceptive feedback, but what, was, what were the physios actually doing to address that? So they were doing things like bringing attention back to movement. So they were always verbalizing movements. They were augmenting proprioception, like to know where the body is. So they were verbalizing progression through the movement. So they were telling, giving people cues to know where they were within a movement. And they didn't stress initiation of movement. It was more about moving than exercise. So to give you an example, <clears throat> there is this. So the physio said, if we tell a patient next, you're going to have to bend forward, you might already trigger some areas in the brain that go, oh, bending forward is really bad. But if you just start doing it, and then you use the continuous tense, and you know, you're reaching the knees because it enhances the sense of being in the movement, 
you get them to already be working through a movement. And that was really um, insightful to know from the physios. Again, another thing, if any of us have done stretches, we do a, could do a stretch and you know count to five. But they were trying to link the stretch with how many breaths people take and telling them, okay, you stretch and then take five deep breaths and hold it for that. So that was encouraging people to breathe and keeping them calm, uh, making it easy to do the exercise themselves, but also it put a bit more responsibility on themselves. So it was not the physio counting to hold a stretch to five. They were telling them how to do that on their own. So these were all interesting things. So here we saw that they were shifting attention to breathing, to increase that feeling of awareness and increasing the sense of achievement by take, getting them to take more responsibility in the decisions for doing this exercise. And so we came up with a prototype, a very simple one, which is a smartphone app. Um, and yeah, it was attached to these two breathing sensors that you can see here, which gave breathing cues when, when the person stopped breathing or held their breath because they were tense. And it was just controlled by a remote and had certain sounds. Um, and basically it was based on the verbal strategies used by physiotherapists. So it just gave them sound feedback and enhanced the sense of being in movement. So I'm going to sort of like um, uh, show you this a little bit. Um, and we refined the prototype for people to use it themselves in their own house. And then they could could see it. So I don't know if you can see it, but Spider-Man is the person in chronic pain. And here's the, um, the app, which could be on the back or could be on the arm or whatever. But basically, it helped them to personalize their movement space. So start position. So set. start a position. So this was important so that they knew what stretch set. they were doing Maximum and what they wanted to do. Set. Uh, Anisha, you, you may need to, to close the background because Spider-Man disappears into the UCL portico. OK, is this better? No. I'm going to um, maybe stop sharing and then it might be easier for me to see what's going on here. Okay, you want me to switch off the uh, background? Right, right, right. I can demonstrate this after yours, Enrico. I can, I can demonstrate this in the design workshop. By then I will have switched okay. off. So but basically, that's, that's great. No, thanks. Good to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Spider-Man doing a disappearing act was not part of it. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that was interesting in terms of what kinds of methods we can use to quickly prototype a solution and then iterate it for what users really need. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Enrico for the second part. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna show uh, sort of in contrast two projects quickly. I, I'm gonna share a video and see who's sharing at the moment, but I'll just share. Um, let's see if this works. Um, that sort of show you something at the other end of the spectrum of, of methods in human factors that are a bit more controlled. I prepared this video yesterday to see if that helps me to be a bit faster. Optimize for video clip. Let's see if this works. Otherwise, we can back up to PowerPoint. Can you see the video? Yep. Hi. I'm going to present two research projects as examples of uh, research methods in human factors. I will start from an example of an online user study and later present an example um, of a lab-based user study. For the online study, I need to start with some background. Everyone here will have heard of uh, convolutional neural networks or CNNs for short. Um, these are a very successful uh, technique in machine learning they offer great performance across a range of applications, including in the medical domain. For this project, <clears throat> the focus was on image classification, i.e. using a neural network to recognize whether um, an image contains an object of a certain type, for example, a horse. One uh, widely accepted and discussed issue of um, CNNs is that it's hard to interpret their operation. For example, to understand what particular image features the network is sensitive to um, and what the chances are that a specific image will be correctly recognized as, for example, containing a horse. So researchers have been developing explanation techniques to try and solve um, this issue. One explanation technique is the generation of saliency maps. You can see an example saliency map on this slide. Um, on the left, we have um, the input image to be classified by the neural network, while on the right, there is the saliency map for the object type horse. 
The pixels highlighted in red are the ones that are considered to be the most responsible for this image to be classified as containing a horse. In this example, we can see that the contour of the lower part of the body and the upper part of the legs um, are um, highlighted, while less so the pixels around the heads of the horses. I should emphasize that this is um, um, an explanation technique that was not developed by us, but we used um, an algorithm published by a group in Germany. We noticed that the scientific literature on this kind of explanations is focused on the technical implementation of the, of the algorithms, but the evaluation is generally um, anecdotal. So our research question for the project was, how well do these serenity maps work? The first challenge was to translate the question into one that could be measured through a user study. We decided to check whether looking at serenity maps could help participants to predict the ability of a network to correctly classify an image as containing, for example, a horse. On this slide, you can see what some of our participants saw. On the top, you can see four example images, each with a corresponding saliency map, um, and the outcome of the network in terms of whether um, the horse um, was correctly recognized or not, um, and also the scores that the network gives to a number of classes, not only horse, but also things like person, um, cow, or, or cat. Um, on the bottom, um, there is a new image and a number of questions, the main one being, based on the examples above, do you think that the network will recognize a horse in this new image or not? To evaluate the effect of the saliency maps, we this divided our participants into four groups. The first group was shown the CNC map and the classification scores, as you can see on the slide. The second group was shown the CNC map, but not the classification scores. The third group was shown the classification scores, but not the CNC map. And the fourth group was shown neither scores nor CNC maps. Participants in this group only saw the input image and whether or not this was correctly recognized um, as a horse. Note that the same information was also available to all other groups. The study was implemented as a simple web application so that it could be accessed through any standard web browser. We recruited 64 participants from a platform called Prolific, which is a website um, acting as a broker between researchers and volunteers for online studies. On prolifics, things go very fast, so it's possible to recruit uh, tens of participants in just minutes. The main result was that participants who saw saliency maps were significantly more accurate in predicting the outcome of the network compared to those who did not see the saliency maps. It should be noted, however, that even with saliency maps, performance is not that much better than chance, which in this case is at 50%. While with CNC maps, participants were correct only about 60% of the, of the times. Let me take a step back and reflect on um, some of the advantages and limitations of online user studies. On the positive side, um, they can be run very quickly and it's easy to find um, participants. Online user studies enable uh, to run comparative tests, like in the example that I just presented, um, we can focus on the presence or absence of specific um, features. On the negative side, they do not represent very realistic conditions. They are generally constrained to um, a web browser, and as a consequence, one cannot directly observe participants and it's not easy to ask questions um, spontaneously. Participants tend to be very motivated by the financial reward on platforms like Prolific, uh, and their attention can be limited. So generally, it's a good idea to keep tasks very brief and um, simple. Um, let's move um, for contrast to an example of a lab-based uh, user study. Um, this is a project that started from um, our own practical needs as we were developing a mobile app around a computer vision um, algorithm. And we realized that there was no research about how to design um, user feedback for this kind of algorithms. Um, we found instead that some commercial mobile apps, such as um, one from um, Amazon, which you can see in this video, 
um, provide what we call key point marker feedback. These little um, dancing dots that you can see in this video indicate features that the computer vision algorithm uses as a starting point to make sense of the image. Um, is it useful to show this kind of um, key point feedback to users? We initially attempted to run this one also as an online study. However, we quickly realized that um, the key point markers are more meaningful if participants can hold uh, the mobile device in their hands and they can see sort of like the action and, and reaction of um, moving the phone and see how the, the key point markers move around. Um, so the design of this experiment turned out to be quite tricky. Um, feedback is particularly useful when things go wrong. So we needed to create a situation where we could make the system fail in a controlled way, um, but not in a way that would be obvious to our participants. So for that, we developed an iPad application to create stop motion um, animation to the kind that you saw on the bottom uh, left of the slide. Normally, this kind of animations are created using a tripod to keep the camera still. Instead, in this study, we used computer vision to stabilize the background. And the trick was that we gave participants some backgrounds which we knew would not work very well, um, yet without being too obvious. Two um, of the uh, six examples that you see here on the slide don't work very well. And you can probably easily guess that this one is not gonna work very well. However, one of the three on the bottom is also not going to work very well. And I think it's not the obvious to guess um, which one. So to one group of participants, we gave an app that provided no feedback. And to another group instead, we gave an app, an app that provided feedback similar to what we saw in the Amazon app. Um, we then tasked participants to create a number of animations with the app using a number of predefined paper cutouts, including those three key backgrounds that I just showed you. And then we asked them which backgrounds they thought would work well and um, which ones they wouldn't and why. Our results indicate that this type of key point um, marker feedback did not help our participants. The key points were often misinterpreted because participants expected the feedback to represent high level information about the system, while instead key points are quite low level. So we decided to test two other feedback designs, which represented higher level information about the algorithm. Um, I don't have time to get into the details, but um, a follow up experiment indeed showed that such higher level feedback um, helps. Going again one step back, let me reflect on advantages and limitations of lab-based user studies. Similar to online studies, um, they enable comparative tests and allow us to focus on the presence or absence of specific features. However, they are not um, as constrained, um, they are not constrained to the web browser, which is critical when we work on specialized um, hardware or um, mobile devices. Um, because both participants and experimenters are in the same location, we can directly observe participants and we can easily ask questions if, for example, we notice anything um, unexpected. On the negative side, um, lab-based studies still represent not very realistic conditions of use. Um, it's harder to find participants and normally things go much slower than with um, online studies. Participants can still be quite motivated by financial reward, so it's still important to keep the tasks quite um, simple, uh, even though less so than for um, an online study. So that's all um, for me, and thank you. Okay, let me switch back to, um, to live and let me share um, another window. Oops. Not, re not a repeat. Um, sorry, uh, always a bit of a balancing act with Zoom. Okay, can you see my uh, browser window? Yes. Perfect. So uh, we, we are going to create four um, breakout rooms and we're going to ask um, all of you to jump into one of them based on what sort of um, technique you would like to um, uh, get deeper um, into. So room number one is about observations. 
Room number two is about interviews. Room number three is about lab studies. And room number four is about online studies. We will do in each room a round of introductions and then hopefully select one of your projects and quickly, um, very quickly, um, try to sketch a possible uh, study design um, or um, which could also be interview or observations again um, around, around that. Um, so, Sujong, are you going to open the breakout rooms? Or uh, yeah. So you can actually go into the breakout rooms now. So you can click the breakout rooms and you can just choose the room that you want it to go. I think I'm, they may not show up for me because I'm screen sharing, but I see participants disappearing from here. So hopefully it's working. Anisha, it was you. Uh, I think Jeremy was room one. It's right, operations. Sorry. Yes, I was. Um, and we, we kind of just had a chat <laughs> <laughs> about the, the different research that were do, going on and, and how we would do it. Um, but the, uh, we were focusing on uh, microsurgery, the role of haptics in microsurgery, and, um, and looking at the way that, uh, doing observational studies of that. So looking at the way that the, um, the expert surgeons do it as opposed to the novice surgeons and looking at those differences. And, um, and so the main focus of doing an observational study here is focusing on the surgeons and the, the context is the operating theater. Um, and the, the idea is to, to kind of find out those nuances that are different and how haptics could help improve um, the, if, if this is, if I'm getting this right thing, um, feel free to jump in. Um, it's so that the novices can get the, use haptics to be able to, you know, improve their skills so they can perform the actions at the same level as a more senior surgeon. So that's kind of where the discussion was, was centered around and um, yeah. Yeah, that's a very accurate summary. Thank you, Jeremy. So, so basically what we um, what discussed, um, so the, the applying haptics in microsurgery is kind of a tacit knowledge and the um, experienced surgeon is just to do it, but it's very difficult to articulate how, how they use that kind of um, uh, physical um, skill to help them to do the operation. Um, it's also difficult to demonstrate this. So um, that, that is why we think that using observation, we can um, um, to look at how actually the experts are using this um, using the haptic skills in, in the um, surgical operation. And then based on this ob um, observation, we can uh, have more insight and then maybe open up a design space um, and using, um, for example, participatory design and um, designing some um, surgical training support techniques um, with the surgeons, residents, and medical students together. And, um, and of course, we also discussed uh, not just uh, um, the uh, haptics in microsurgery. Um, surgery. We also um, talk about more general issues about um, you know, surgical training um, in, um, in other um, surgical um, areas. Right, thank you. Um, shall we, in the interest of time, shall we move to room number two? This, this one was Anisha, right? Do you have a speaker uh, uh, nominated already? I think we had a really interesting set of problems and we also just discussed things. So um, I realized that I'm not a very good multitasker in this sense. And I, when I was doing Miro, I was just destroying it. So I can see that Nicholas is using it now to put in some challenges and, and things. Um, would, would anybody like to introduce what the problem was that we were working on? And uh, then we can all pitch in with the background. I'm happy to. Um, uh, there was three different problems. And I think we ended up working on talking about two of them. Um, I don't remember what the third one was. The two, two of them were like uh, related to um, ophthalmology. So um, eye disorders. 
Uh, one of them, which was uh, mine, was about a decision support system called uh, ITGene, which um, is to help uh, to assist in the diagnosis diagnosis of genetic eye diseases. So it just takes in as an image and gives you a prediction of what gene is 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 associated with the disease. Uh, and the child and it, what I was interested in was uh, how to design reports for end users, uh, bearing in mind that there would be uh, two, at least two types of users, uh, users which are very good at the imaging side and have a lot of knowledge of the imaging side, but little knowledge of the genetics, and also users who have, uh, and, and the converse, users who have knowledge of the genetics, uh, but not much knowledge of, um, of the imaging side. And we also discussed about how uh, we could use um, how uh, the algorithm would be uh, explaining using saliency maps, for example, how it arrived at a specific diagnosis and whether users could provide feedback on that. And the second project, I'll let Peter talk about it if he's still here, which was about synthetic eye images. Yeah, so um, part of my PhD is around producing um, synthetic eye scans. And as part of the evaluation process, we want to think about how, um, what the quality of these images are and speaking to domain experts about what they think about how good the images are. Um, and I'm sort of trying to think about exactly the best way of doing that. And so we were discussing some potential sort of means by which we could um, get domain experts to evaluate these images sort of how, whether we tell them that they're fake, whether we tell them, give them a bunch of images, some of which are fake and some of them aren't. Um, and also thinking about the sort of decision-making process behind how people evaluate diagnostic imaging, sort of they can talk about features of the image which may be particularly consistent with certain diagnoses. Um, and sort of we thought about maybe having a sort of one-on-one -on -one or two-to-one discussion uh, around that could be useful in sort of trying to evaluate this problem. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we are really um, um, a bit beyond, um, uh, like sort of. Um, or I think we're running a bit late compared to the to the to the uh, plan time. We're going to have the the keynote soon. So if we can have maybe just very few words about um, the last two rooms, um, just to to give a sense, and then everyone will still have access to the to the mirror board to find out more. But I'm keen to just give, give a quick. Okay. Um, uh, I'm the speaker for the third breakout room, and uh, we discussed uh, about lab studies. And I am doing a, a lab study where I include uh, five um, uh, participants from above 50, and I look at the breast tissue of these women because for a new breast imaging modality, it's called 3D computed tomography photo acoustic breast scanning. I want to see how I could get more breast tissue available in the field of view in the system. And we were actually discussing um, yeah, the, the different components that you want to get right before you do the lab study. And I actually uh, already did the study, but now I have to process the data. And a really nice tip that we, we discussed was that maybe um, uh, because I have some quantitative data, but also some qualitative data, and it would be nice to maybe show this to the experts of, or to the clinics and let them have a, um, let them uh, uh, yeah give a give a scale or a number about uh, uh, to to grade these images, for example, to make it a little bit more quantitative data and to get the experts view on it as well. So. Thank you. That that's great. And Roxana, in literally thirty seconds, could you please briefly uh, talk about our room? You're muted, Roxana. Okay, I just lost ten seconds. Um, so we were just quickly talking about the exploring the design space for uh, a technology that could could help wheelchair users. Um, decrease the stress while they're navigating in the city, either through the stage of planning or just, you know, by monitoring how they're feeling throughout the, the road. So in general, it was just a exploration of the, of the design space, either through 
uh, just identifying directly from, in our case, the users, which are wheelchair users, what they would find interesting to add while they're moving around. And the plan was to do this as an online study due to the COVID uh, restrictions that we have now, but also it gives us the opportunity to recruit more you know, people to participate, which in other scenario would have been more difficult due to accessible reason, accessibility reasons. And um, yeah, I think that would be the summary. I think time is up. Thank you very much, Roxana. Um, I think next is Jeremy, right? Yep, it's me. So, um, so another part of um, this symposium is to be able to launch a, a website that we've created that actually provides uh, human factors support for engineers who are developing things for healthcare. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Hopefully that's the right screen. Can everyone see that? Um, so this is um, a, a bunch of information specifically for engineers um, who are developing things in healthcare. And it, it kind of talks about, it, talks about how human factors fit into engineering and when to incorporate human factors and the things that all the things that have been discussed today. Um, so one of the one of the key things we found is that when people are developing healthcare products, they tend to uh, either not realize that human factors is something that could be used to improve technology or they implement it, they think about it too late into the project when it actually ends up costing them a lot of money. Um, and whereas a lot of the human factors actually happens before a project even begins. So, which is understanding the, the user needs and then there are processes in line to help with the design stage to make sure it is actually fit for purpose. And then um, there's also human factors, testing and refining processes that uh, work alongside engineering uh, testing and refining to make sure that it's fit for purpose. It's something that the users enjoy, that it creates the right amount of safety and that it's actually useful and usable in the situation. So, so this website, which is um, hosted on the WISE um, page, it's, you can find it from there. Uh, it, this is funded by the Fast Healthcare Network Plus and also by WISE, it was joint funded. Um, and so you can go into all the different sections on the side here um, where we look at, you know, not only getting surface information from people, but delving into what people dream about what they what they know what they feel and that in each of these groups here so for um observations you know what an observations are why would use them when would use them how we use them the pros and cons and things to consider when uh conducting observations and so each of these um methods uh you know have the same same outline and for anyone who wants uh the physical or you know, the PDF version, you can get that as well uh, here. So uh, hopefully this will be a good resource for everyone who's um, developing things for healthcare and to be able to make sure that you're implementing human factors, not only at the, at the right time, but understanding how they can help uh, improve uh, your, whatever you're creating. So I'll put a link to that in the, um, in the chat as well. Right. I assume it's now handing over to me. Um, so um, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the breakout activities. Um, it is now my great pleasure um, to welcome Helena Mentis um, from the University of Baltimore, UMBC. I'm not sure what the acronym stands for. Um, I've just realized I should have looked it up, shouldn't I? Um, I've known Helena for quite a long time. She was a earlier at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, where she was doing, um, already doing work on novel interventions for surgery. Um, but I can't remember how many years ago that was now, but she's a lot younger than me, so it can't be that many. Um, she's also taken on a lot of really important kind of community roles. So she is almost at the end of a three year term as the, as the president of the ACM um, group, 
what are we, community um, on human computer interaction. And I know that's been a huge role for her as well as doing her research and all the other things that we do as academics. Um, so I'd very much like to welcome Helena. She's on the call somewhere um, and hand over to you and really looking forward to your talk. Thank you, and yeah, I actually did the uh, math uh, in putting together this talk, and it has been something like 11 years that uh, since I started at Microsoft. So wow. <laughs> I've been doing this work for over a decade, and I was really super surprised by that. Um, uh, I, I lost some years in the middle there. Uh, I think that that's what happens when you have kids. So uh, um, I uh, have fun technology issues at home. So I'm going to speak to you through my iPad, which uh, holds a connection, but I'm going to display to you through my computer, which is much better. Um, so uh, if I could be given uh, access to share my screen on the one that is not, the Helena Mentis that is not unmuted. <laughs> Originally, I actually signed in as the ACM Sig Chi too. Okay, <laughs> um, hey, I think I've made the other Helena Mentis um, a co-host. <laughs> so I think that other one should be able to share your screen. Try. Uh, I know it's, it's fun. I can always switch if I have to. Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. I see it now. Thank you. Um, let's see how this works. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much for that little bit. Um, Okay, so yeah, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about the work that really this is about a decade in the making that I've been crafting my concept around crafting the image in surgery. And I really enjoyed like a little bit of the, the uh, conversation that I was able to pop into there um, to really understand that this is a group who understands the benefits of human factors to really look at how people use and um, how they do work and how they need technology to be able to support that. Um, and so I hope to also give you a little bit of an insight as to some new ways to think about how people use technology in healthcare um, and how we can be creating even better technology for them. So, um, oh, oddly enough, this photo did not show up. That's so unfortunate. So, um, you'll see on the left hand side here, this photo of uh, a surgeon looking down. And that's sort of how we, what we understand about surgery um, from watching movies and what historically has been what surgery is. You have a surgeon who is uh, looking down at the table. There is a body who is on the table, hopefully under anesthesia um, and, um, and is, uh, is open and so because of that, the surgeon is able to see the anatomy um, in front of them. However, uh, even a decade ago, and definitely over the past 10 years, surgery has really changed. And this is really uh, where surgery is going. Um, very much focused on minimally invasive surgery, first of all. And because of that, integrating imaging into the surgical practice at the table itself, and it being fundamental to the surgery's outcome. So we see uh, technology such as a PAC system, picture archiving, a computer system, on the wall um, at which the surgeons leave actually the surgical site, they leave the table to walk over um, and um, pull up, for instance, preoperative MRIs, which I believe this was. Um, you also see a little bit over here, uh, this is uh, uh, fluoroscopic x-rays that are being used. This is all neurosurgery here. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, integrated uh, imaging at the table side itself, um, the, uh, these are preoperative MRIs that were loaded into uh, a, a 
a system that allows for wayfinding within the body cavities. And then all the way on the right is a typical uh, endoscope uh, video image. Um, and those technologies being sort of fit around the table in order to have the best view while the surgery is happening. And some of the work that um, I cite here at the bottom really showed how the technology was, was integrated into the surgery at, as a point of decision-making, um, integrating with feeling the body and looking at the images all at the same time. And this is the type of work we need to be able to support um, uh, as this is really the future of surgery. Um, this was neurosurgery that I was looking at, but then I also, uh, this was at Adderbrooks Hospital in um, Cambridge, UK when I was at Microsoft, um, which really got me interested in how we're integrating these um, technologies and how we could do a better job of allowing surgeons to integrate these technologies into their surgical practice. Um, and so uh, this is another one that just didn't show up for some reason. My box must have not liked technology today. Uh, <laughs> and so what we saw with uh, neurosurgery was the use of different types of, um, that was neurosurgery, sorry. What we saw with vascular surgery was again, different types of uh, imaging being able to be integrated into inserting stents into an aorta. Um, floor time, at the same time, um, integrating real-time fluoroscopy, um, a 2D uh, pre-op CT scan, and then a 3D overlay, which was uh, models developed from those preoperative CT scans. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why between last night and this morning, the uh, technology decided to kill all my videos and images. It was working. Give me one second. So while I'm waiting for uh, the PowerPoint to actually open up again. Um, so the vac vascular surgery was really interesting because they had these 3D models that they were developing um, that allowed them to actually uh, uh, be able to have a better understanding of the anatomy as they were working um, on uh, these uh, vascular aneurysms, complex vas vascular aneurysms. However, one of the things that was the problem with being able to do that is that they really needed to call across um, to somebody else to be able to interact with these images. And that was actually a, a real problem for, um, for the surgery, um, for the surgeons to be able to think about the surgery at the same time while asking somebody to move the images into the right um, orientation in order for them to get the information that they really wanted from that. Yeah. Would it work if you show it in PowerPoint without actually presenting? It might if it actually opens. <laughs> As I said, uh, my, uh, my computers have all decided to crash after a year of over pushing them um, in uh, um, uh, the pandemic. And this has been really fun these last few weeks of the semester into recently when my uh, my iMac crashed and I've been making do with both an iPad and, a, and my old laptop, which doesn't quite do things as quickly as I want it to. No, this is really, I should have checked it again this morning. I apologize. I do realize it's very early in the morning still for you. So. It's it's not that bad in the morning. It's just like, yeah, I had it all ready last night. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go, get my coffee, sit down. And of course, like my technology is like, no, 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 no. 
that was last night. This is this morning. It's completely different technology. I believe that's called human factors. It just won't open now. Would, would it help if you share the file with any of us? And... It is a pretty big file because I have um, video and everything on it. Um, I'm afraid this might have been that my computer decided to crash. I think my computer decided to crash. <laughs> I know so. Okay, it's the Hail Mary. Mary <laughs> start. Oh, this is so unfortunate. It's really hard to give this talk without making sure you get to see some of the really cool videos but we're gonna be unable to open that. <laughs> Everything just totally died on me. So perhaps you could just give the key highlights now and maybe share, I will. share the videos I will. later. Yeah, I will absolutely share this when I get this working for you. So, um, so vascular surgery, they had these really interesting images. So the question was, how can we um, help them better integrate the technology at the site of the work? And that was the work that I was doing at Microsoft where we were able to use the Kinect as a mechanism of touchless interaction, being able to gesture and move the, um, the surgical images. One of the things that, um, that we were able to see when we were able to actually um, deploy the system is um, first of all, there is a lot of this dynamic into um, uh, interaction with the technology. Um, so for instance, um, uh, it wasn't just that they put the image, uh, yeah, you know, maybe moved it a little bit to the left and then started doing the work and like moved on with what they were doing, but rather they were um, sort of going a little bit left going a little bit right, up and down, fading in and out the overlay. Um, and this dynamic interaction was actually quite interesting. It showed that getting an image to a certain position isn't really the goal as they were doing when they were having, when they were calling to somebody, but rather they were looking and moving at the same time, which allowed them to sort of get a full gestalt understanding of the surgical space, um, of the images uh, that they were working on and, and sort of be able to relate that to the anatomy that they maybe were feeling as they were um, doing their minimally invasive surgery. And so that was one of the things that came out of that. The other one was the fact that they were doing this dynamic interaction at the same time as talking with one another. So in general, surgery is actually very collaborative, um, not only just because you have the anesthesia and you have nurses in the room, but usually there's two surg surgeons um, working and supporting. So there's usually a lead and then there's um, a, a support surgeon next to them. Um, and what you then see is not only this dynamic interaction, but this dynamic interaction at the same time um, talking to one another. Um, and talking and, and discussing the images and talking about how it relates to the body that they're doing, uh, that they're working on themselves. And so this was another really interesting aspect of the surgery that really highlighted um, the sort of very integrated aspect of using these images um, in the surgical uh, practice, if you just give them this ability to um, integrate this additional information and knowledge into their work. Um, so uh, along the time, along the while of being able to present this work, um, you know, uh, and trying to publish it, some of our findings, you know, we always end up with reviewer two who uh, has some comment to make. And one of them that I always thought was was really interesting was, well, don't um, couldn't voice control just be used instead of gesture control? Like, why are you using voice control? And of course, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, did you read the paper? <laughs> it's kind of in there, but. Um, because I wanted to sort of prove a point. Um, uh, I, we ran a new study uh, where we used um, a system that had both voice, voice control and gesture control and allowed people to um, be able to interact with the, the images however they want, the surgeons to interact with them however they want. And one of the really interesting things that came out of that um, work was that, um, even though the surgeons really knew how to use the system and they knew how to use both the voice control and the gesture control, when they walked up to the system to be able to use it in the surgical um, procedure, to look up some images, 
um, uh, the, the video that I would have showed you is the surgeon automatically goes to sort of put out his hand and starts moving in and out, which is how you step through MRI slices. Um, that's the type of technology, uh, the, the imaging system that they were using. And it really just highlighted how um, uh, even when they have voice control, how they go and they want to work with it physically. Um, and what's very interesting is he's talking about the images at the same time with his, um, with his fellow and his resident and his medical student, they're all standing around and they're talking about the images as he's doing this dynamic moving in and out of the images. So it really just goes to show that, um, yes, voice control is a little bit more accurate. For instance, uh, especially back then the connect was not so great. It's getting a lot better now. Um, but it really highlights that you need to be thinking about where is the technology being used? How is it integrated into the practice of the healthcare work that they're doing? Um, and, and understanding that a lot of this um, really um, engenders some type of physical interaction. I put those in quotes. Um, because uh, that is the practice that they're doing with those images. They're um, moving them. The last related study, and because I want to make sure that I don't go over in time with the technology issues, but I wanted to highlight was, um, so this is really interesting that surgeons are integrating these images into their practice, but then the question is, how do new surgeons learn how to do this type of work? And one of the things that um, I've been learning by um, lo looking at uh, training surgeons and, and over the course of four or five years as they're training, what, um, what are the skills that they're taking on and where are they picking these up? That surgical training, even in minimally invasive surgical training, like laparoscopic um, uh, surgery, um, a lot of the skills training is around how to use the tools um, how to insert them and move them and manipulate them, which obviously is a very important part of surgery. Most of surgery is learning how to tie loops and how to cut and how to physically interact with the body. But there isn't a lot of actual training and simulation around how to use images. Not only how to use images, but how to find and create the best image in order to do the work because a lot of their training is how to create the best body, how to excise additional tissue so you can see the anatomy in just the proper orientation. So then you know what exactly to cut or to move or to staple or whatever is the actual surgical process. A lot of that is called um, dissecting, but dissecting is actually about creating a view of the anatomy which you, you as the surgeon know what you're looking at because it's kind of a mush when they first go in there and that's a technical term. Um, but also uh, you've, you've got to be able to do that with images as well. You have to be able to discipline the image so that it is giving you the best view. That might be looking in or looking out or panning to the left or panning to the right, but it also is um, a case of um, being able to annotate the image, um, particularly when you're collaboratively talking, being able to circle parts of the anatomy so that your collaborator knows exactly what you're talking about or having a pointer that points to that. Um, these are parts of uh, disciplining uh, the image that I think a lot of people are unaware of. And they don't really recognize that this is now what the new surgical practice is about. It's not about even just having an image thrown up on the wall, but it's allowing surgeons to manipulate and to um, collaborate around those um, surgical images. Um, I think the last thing that I wanted to make sure that I was able to tell you, I finally got my, uh, oh, it's to come up. So if you have a time, I can always show you one little video. Um, a lot of the work that I've been doing since then has been looking at telemedicine. So now that, especially because of the pandemic, but this was happening even before that, surgical telemedicine to actually integrate um, uh, telecommunication systems to allow surgeons, an expert surgeon um, uh, on a particular uh, type of surgery, for instance, a particular technique to be able to weigh in, for instance, on um, to, uh, the surgical practice um, to be able to, you know, uh, uh, say, oh, you know, you need to be going left or going right here without having to move their body. Um, it's actually quite important to be able to do this. And one of the things that I thought was um, really interesting is how the field of computer supported cooperative work has been looking at work at a distance 
for literally decades here. And when I first started talking to surgeons about this, they said, you know, gosh, nobody knows how to do this. And, and, and nobody's been talking about this. And I was like, ho, 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 <laughs> hold, hold on there. There's an entire field that does this. And they were actually quite surprised. So, you know, this, this is really important. Don't think that everybody just knows the knowledge that you have in your head. Surgeons care about these things but they actually are unaware of the long history of um, technology development and, and evaluation. And so um, I think that uh, that was one of the things that I thought was actually most interesting when I was um, doing the telesurgery work. But what is really uh, that, that work has really shown recently is that you need to be able to support both surgeons, both local and remote to have equal access to the images to be able to do that crafting work. And a lot of what have we been doing in quote unquote telesurgical work is just to have something like this, to have basically a fancy Zoom uh, in front of you. And all you can do is just watch me uh, and listen to me. But as you think of you as the remote surgeon, but I'm the one quote unquote doing the work on my computer and I'm having a problem, but there's no way for you to really like come in and help me um, remotely. All you're able to do right now is to give me advice, but I'm the one still having to do the work. And so that's one of those things that um, uh, I don't think we've really been able to understand up until this point. And the pandemic has just pushed this um, much further for us to really try to understand how to help this work. Um, at a distance. Um, so I would like to, uh, at this point, um, leave you with uh, uh, the opportunity to ask me questions about this. And if we have one minute, I did get my slides to finally come up and I do have one video from the surgical tele uh, telemedicine uh, uh, observations that I did. Um, that I can show you one of these crafting from a distance practices and how it's really not second nature for them to do this, but once given the opportunity to, they, they see and recognize um, the, the benefit of this to their work practices and their communication. And, um, and what we're doing is we keep adding new types of remote crafting of video and, uh, and testing them out, usually in simulation uh, environments. I'm, I'm not a big fan of going right in, right directly into the operating room. Um, so if whoever is running it can give me access for my other computer, I can share that, but um, I can also take questions now. Great, so thank you so much, particularly for the professional approach to uh, dealing with technology. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> um, so while we're sorting out the technology in the background, are there any questions? I can't just trying to keep track on the hand raising or those of you who are co-hosts, um, you'll just have to show your video and so Sulin, I assume that you're getting the tech working in the background. Is that correct? Have all the Helena Mentises possible got? Ah, uh, yeah. There's a new Helena Mentis that needs shared access. If you could. Thank I'm you. The new one's been made a co host. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Sulin. Um, so, I mean, I do have questions inevitably, but let's, let's, let's see the videos first. You probably need to turn your audio off on your other machine. Is there audio on this? I think we can't hear the audio. So the system, sorry, that we have in the middle there is called the Visitor One. 
And so this is, uh, these surgeons are uh, in mountain time and Eastern time talking to one another uh, during a laparoscopic uh, hernia repair. And so what we're gonna see is the middle surgeon is trying to explain via voice what needs to be done, this, this special technique for hernia repair. Um, and what happened is that the, uh, the local surgeons like, why don't you just point to it on the video? I can, you can see my video. I'm, I'm um, sending you my, uh, my laparoscopic video. And so that's uh, what we're gonna see here. There we go. That was one of the videos that I wanted to make sure to be able to, to share with you. And um, it's really interesting that, um, you know, uh, it's not that he forgot that there was the technology there. He just didn't think about what's the best use of the technology. So one of the things that we're doing now is um, we're training the trainers how best to use the functionality in order to get certain types of instruction and points across. They actually need to sort of realize that, you know, when you're talking about anatomy, you should be pointing to the anatomy. When you're talking about movement, you can use um, the annotation feature to be able to show that movement. Um, if you, you know, you, you also need to coordinate. So you can either take a snapshot and draw on that, or you can tell your local surgeon, hey, can you hold your laparoscope uh, uh, study so that I can draw on top of that. And then obviously there's more technology that can be um, used in that intervention. But ultimately a lot of this comes down to being able to craft um, the image, to be able to manipulate and to be able to do it both locally and remotely equal access because that allows for that um, discussion to occur, that collaboration to occur, that knowledge transfer to occur that doesn't require the surgical the surgeon himself to move his body to uh, time zones over in the U.S., for instance. So um, this is type of the this is the type of work that we're doing now to come up with new ways of being able to craft the 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 body and using new technologies. So um, I saw earlier um, you, you did have Mark talking about the Hololens, and we're also using the Hololens bit as a mechanism of tele uh, telemedicine and surgery. So being able um, while you're doing work um, to be able to have somebody to be able to see your view and to be able to annotate on it and um, be able to refer to it and, and help you do the work wherever that work may um, occur. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've probably got time for one question. If somebody other than me would like to generate has a question they would like to ask. So in the silence, I will ask, um, you know, you, you've emphasized quite a lot about telemedicine and you've also emphasized about crafting. And I guess for me, one of the key questions in this space is about how do we make sure it stays safe? You know, we've just experienced a total technology meltdown. Um, <laughs> where that technology is critical. I mean, you, you said we don't go straight into the operating theater. We try to do it in simulation first. Um, what are your thoughts about how to make sure that we make things, keep things safe when we That's are- That's a great question. <laughs> rely on the technology to, to actually mediate some directions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so this is actually one of the first uh, discussions that I had when I had the opportunity of meeting with a number of surgeons around um, the future of telementoring in surgical, uh, in lapros laparoscopy. Um, uh, and, you know, they obviously care about safety. Um, it's, it's more a question of, of what are you using the technology for? So you're not going to have, for instance, a resident um, who really needs a lot more hands-on, um, literally sometimes, um, training, being able to do uh, a surgery by themselves with a remote 
um, expert surgeon looking over their shoulder, and then you have a complete meltdown of technology and, and things go awry. Um, the, the idea is that there's always a fail safe, there's always a backup. So for instance, for surgical telementoring, um, the, first of all, the surgeons already know one another. It's not a random surgeon coming in. He's like, oh, hey, I'm Bob <laughs> and you know, I'm your surgeon today. That's not a very good working relationship. So that actually is a point of failure right there. You need to make sure that the surgeons know one another and that they have at least like tried doing this in the simulation first and they feel comfortable working together. Um, the second thing is that the local surgeon, he, he or she usually already knows how to do the surgery. They technically are able to do the surgery with no support. However, this is additional support for one of two reasons, either A, because um, the local surgeon feels a little bit like not comfortable doing the new technique themselves completely by themselves. So it's sort of like an extra mentor to just sort of be like, no, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing that um, to remind them of things that they had learned when they were co-located, for instance, in a sim center starting um, practicing a new surgery. And then also that if the technology really goes down and, uh, and there's absolutely no way of getting back up and everything is going really badly, typically any of these laparoscopic surgeries can also be done open. So just like in any laparoscopic surgery, if it's going poorly, if it's really bad, if you really have a bleeder or you have something that was nicked that you now need to go in and suture um, right away, the decision point at that point is to open up the body and to do not minimally invasive, to do invasive um, surgery. And, and that every one of these surgeons know how to do themselves. That's not a problem for them. They know how to do a hernia repair, uh, you know, to, to repair a bile duct um, during a, a gallbladder removal, for instance. So they, they have actually thought about all of the fail safes that need to be put into place, but it really comes down to work practices more than a technological intervention. But once you have those work practices in place, um, then it comes down to what can the technology do? Great, so thank you so much, Helena. And thank You're you. Welcome. I'm just bringing up a different window so that I, I can see something else in the background. Um, so thank you for that. I'd also really like to thank all the organizers for today. Um, it was, Sujong, Sulin, Jeremy, Anisha, Enrico, Matt, um, everybody who's supported, Dan as well, obviously, um, and, and the team behind the scenes, the, the Weiss uh, comms team, um, or I, I, I don't even know what you call yourself, but I know you've all been um, contributing and it's all made for a great morning even though some of the technology hasn't worked quite in the way that we want it. And that's not just for, for you, Helena, we had, we had some technical glitches earlier as well. Um, so it's been a bit of a technical glitch morning, but I think it's still been a really valuable experience. And we've learned, well, I've certainly learned a lot and I've thought about the problem in a different way, a lot more about the communications in teams and how there's a, a gradient between training a surgeon and a surgeon practicing and them not those not being really distinct phases, but that there are important overlaps and the role of the technology in kind of fitting in an augmenting practice. Um, when I was first writing about this kind of area, you know, I found a quote from Kirkup in 1981, who, who notes that tools and instruments have evolved to facilitate, extend and refine practices where hands and fingers alone prove clumsy and inadequate or fall short. And what he was talking about there was surgical knives, you know, that very original surgical technology that dates back about 10,000 years now. Um, so really we are evolving technologies in, in surgery and other kinds of interventions. And the latest technologies are um, making a lot of new things possible, making things yeah, augment, not just augmenting, but actually creating new possibilities so that we get better patient outcomes in the, in the long run. Um, so on that hopefully ha um, hopeful note, um, you know, we've also heard a lot about what's not been sorted out yet and you know, all, all the challenges that remain for the future. Um, and so thank you to the speakers, particular thanks to Su Jung, 
who only arrived at UCL about, well, less than two months ago. And when I say arrived, Su Zhong is still in Sydney in Australia um, and will physically arrive at UCL at some point when it's safe to do so. Um, and Jeremy and all the rest of the team. And I hope everybody's had a, a, a really interesting and useful morning um, and that we can keep working together and make it better. So on that note, I will um, declare the meeting closed for today. Um, but this is just you know, one step in a long conversation about how we can actually make advanced engineering technologies work more effectively and actually be transformative in clinical practice. And that's gonna be a long conversation um, and a lot of work. So thank you everybody. Um, and enjoy your lunch and we'll continue the conversations at another time.